the story of how I got interested in ecology and birds, like many people, can be traced back to a family member. So in my case, very young, I was following my grandmother around who took weekend birding class at the local university. And um, I was interested in birds, had a propensity for being able to identify them by sound, and just kind of went from there. My name is Dale Gofflick, and I'm the Endowed Chair for Conservation and Biodiversity at the Hart Research Institute. My research expertise is with water birds mostly, and I do research on water birds in the context of wetland restoration and management. Today on the Golf Podcast, I've enlisted Dr. Dale Govlik and the laughing gulls and other sounds of Oso Bay so we can learn more about one of North America's largest and rarest birds, the whooping crane. These unique and beautiful birds spend the winter in the bays and estuaries of the mid-Texas coast. This is Jen, by the way, and I'm the creator, writer, and producer of the Golf Podcast. Student production assistant Alyssa Lucas helps out, and funding for the Watershed series comes from the Hart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. I should tell you, though, that the views and opinions expressed on this podcast may not represent the views and opinions of the Hart Research Institute or Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. In Season 2, we're exploring the importance of freshwater inflow and coastal water issues. Birds on the coast need good habitat and fresh water, whether they are residents or coming or going. Well, there's the two most important ingredients, right? The water, well, sort of water is part of the habitat, but for the majority of these, these water birds we have here in the coast, they depend on these shallow water lagoons and estuaries and the, the wetlands that are associated with them to provide food. The islands are very important as nesting sites, and um, they also serve as migratory habitat for oh, huge numbers of birds that come through that winter south of here and breed uh, north, Canada, all the way to the Arctic. So, you know, these habitats are really important here. Whooping cranes are essentially the original winter Texans. Each year, they make an incredible journey down here to Texas for our mild winters. And we have the last remaining wild population of whooping cranes in North America. They're called the Aransas Wood Buffalo population, and they almost went extinct in the 1900s. These cranes spend their summers nesting and rearing young in Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada. It's a massive national park. It's actually the second largest national park in the world, and it's located on the border of northern Alberta and southern Northwest Territories. That's almost to the Arctic Circle. There, the whooping cranes nest in shallow wetlands and marshy areas surrounded by boreal forests. They lay two eggs, but usually only one chick survives. The crane pairs raise their chicks in the extended daylight of the north and beneath the dancing glow of the aurora borealis. As the light fades in September and October, the crane families begin their long migration to Texas. They fly almost 2,500 miles from northern Canada to the Texas coast. On the journey southward, the cranes travel through the farms and prairies of Saskatchewan, North Dakota, and South Dakota, stopping along the Missouri River, then the Platte River in Nebraska, then all the other national wildlife refuges, wetlands, and farm ponds as they venture through the southern plains. They arrive on our shores in November. On the wintering grounds, whooping cranes eat primarily blue crabs and a small fruit called a wolfberry. Uh, it's found in uh, coastal marshes, salt marshes. But people who have quantified their diets will say, well, geez, they really eat lots of different stuff as well. So they eat a lot, you know, invertebrates like a dragonfly larva, things like that. Um, and pretty much, you know, anything they can catch. But the two big items, if you had to pull two items out, it would be blue crabs and wolfberry. Chapter 2, The Long Flight Back. The whooping crane is really a neat story from a conservation perspective because, you know, it's this really charismatic bird. It stands up five feet tall. It's white. It's got this red crest and really interesting behaviors. And people like it because it's monogamous and it seems to have a lot of the values that people like, right? It takes care of its young for a long time and fiercely protective. So really interesting birds from that perspective. They 
have historically wintered on the Gulf Coast and over time their numbers dwindled as we converted prairies to agriculture fields and we, we hunted them uh, before they were protected in the early 1900s. During this time, whooping cranes almost went extinct. Cranes used to be found throughout a broad stretch of the North American continent, but this narrowed considerably. By mid-century, only a small population remained, the ones who wintered at the recently created Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. In 1942, the refuge manager only counted 15 adult cranes. It was so bleak that scientists for a time didn't even know where these last remaining cranes nested in Canada. That's quite the detective story, and I think one for a future episode. At any rate, with a lot of work from both nations, Whooping cranes began their long flight back from the brink of extinction. The next step came a bit later, the plans to create a second self-sustaining population elsewhere. There is the Ranzas wood buffalo population, which we have already mentioned. That's like the last remaining natural one. But the recovery plan says, well, if you don't have a thousand wild whooping cranes in that population, we would also consider it recovered if you could establish 160 whooping cranes in another population, in an eastern population. And so that's what a lot of the effort has been focused on, is trying to get another population or two established outside of that wood buffalo Aransas population. And there, <clears throat> there's been a, a number of different efforts to get a population started. And so now there are, there are two populations, uh, one that migrates from Wisconsin to the Gulf, that's producing offspring on its own, and that's very exciting. And then the other one is a non-migratory population in Louisiana, and that's producing offspring. So those two are right now probably our best hope for getting a second population of whooping cranes established. And how the recovery team got that first population established is a great story. One group was set up to help the introduction of an eastern population of whooping cranes. And that was the one that breeds in Wisconsin and then winters along the Gulf. And um, there were some decisions to be made about what's the best way to make that happen. But to get the birds, the juveniles, down to the wintering area, they used ultralight aircraft. And the pilot was dressed as a crane, believe it or not, and flew all the way from Wisconsin to the Gulf Coast dressed as a crane, stopping along the way and uh, the juveniles followed down to the Gulf. Along the way, the public has become fascinated with cranes, myself included. Every January before I start teaching in the spring, my friend Karen and I take a trip up the coast to see big trees and whooping cranes. This year I thought it would be the perfect time to record crane calls for the podcast. When we got to the spot, just down the road from the Ranzas National Wildlife Refuge, we found 17 cranes. But they were impossible to record. It turns out, finding these rare and amazing birds brings crowds of people and loads of money to the coast each year. For coastal economies dependent on tourism, the value of birds is significant. You know, I'm an ecologist by training, so lots of elements of nature interest me. But I've noticed over my career, and even and early on, that people like birds, right? They value them. All, I mean, all aspects of nature are worthy of study and understanding. But birds were different in some ways because people put such high value on them. They spent $32 billion in 2021 watching birds globally and five to six billion per year feeding them. Well, that, those are remarkable statistics, right? That shows that we really do value birds. So when whooping cranes suffer, so too do coastal economies and small towns along the coast. And that's exactly what happened back in 2008 and 2009. Before I get into that though, Let's pause and switch gears to talk about water and some important coastal processes for whooping crane populations. We're going from cranes, one of the most charismatic animals on Earth, to some of the most uncharismatic animals, all of the curious organisms called benthos that live near the bottom of bodies of water. Benthos are essentially tiny creatures that live in the mud. 
There are shrimpy things called crustacea, a variety of amphipods, tenaids, and small shrimps. And then, of course, there are the worms. They're the dominant group. These are the annelids, so they're related to, like, the earthworms you see in, in your lawn. But uh, they're all polychaet worms. So the, the marine worms are all the polychaet worms. And they're different from the things in your lawn in that they have little, they're called parapodia. They're like little swimming legs. So each segment will have a little leg. And there are a variety of them because they exploit every food web and niche possible. So some are just ingesting mud and literally stripping organic matter of the mud. Some are eating other organisms. Some act like shrimp. They have tentacles they put up in the water column and they take particles out of the water column. So the worms are incredibly diverse. So they're the largest group, most dominant group, most diverse group. And finally, you got the mollusks. And we got lots of different kinds. We have snails, we have clams. But those are the two dominant ones, the snails and the clams. But there's some other ones like the tusk shells. So imagine a snail with, with a straight shell. <laughs> and of course, the mollusks have very diverse feeding groups as well. Some are just browsing the surface, looking for materials that have fallen on the bottom of the ocean. And some are, are filter feeding again also, or suspension feeding, eating particles that are in the water column. And of course, the most famous mollusk is an oyster. The most famous crustacean is the shrimp. So two of these things grow to size that have become commercially exploitable. And as you might imagine, those two species are some of the most important bioindicators we look at all the time. That's Dr. Paul Montagna, Chair for Hydroecology at the Heart Research Institute and our guide for the Watershed series. As a coastal scientist who studies freshwater inflow, he's studied a lot of benthos and even has a benthic copepod named after him. Copepods, by the way, are weird little crustaceans that live in water and are really common. Copepods and other benthos even help scientists like Paul monitor freshwater inflow. You know, it's interesting. Obviously, inflow is freshwater mixing with salt water, which means the big changes are occurring in the water column. The salinities are changing, the nutrients are changing. But when the nutrients are there, the phytoplankton can bloom. The phytoplankton, of course, feed the entire food web. But, you know, all of that is incredibly ephemeral. With inflow, outflow, and incoming and outgoing tides, water conditions constantly change in our bays and estuaries. So the question is, well, how, how do we just take the pulse of the ecosystem? Kind of like when you walk into the doctor's office and he takes your temperature or measures your pulse, right? How have you been doing? Well, the answer, I think, is to look at the things that live in the mud. Why? Because they're fixed in place. Yet they're sampling and integrating what's going on over their head 24-7, 365. <laughs> they're always affected by the conditions above them. And they literally integrate everything that's happened since the last time you visited them. And so by looking at the critters that live in the mud, we can literally take the pulse of the ecosystem once a month, once a quarter, at larger intervals in time. And they're literally telling us, Oh, here's what's been going on since the last time I've seen you. <laughs> and so even though they're not something that's charismatic or very large or in the public eye, it turns out they're the most sensitive indicator of changing the environment over time. So that's why I've always focused my research on the bioindicators for inflow on the kind of things that live in the mud. The other thing about freshwater inflow, if you remember from the last episode, is that it has an indirect relationship to fish and other organisms. So inflow defines estuary conditions like salinity and sediments and other things, and those estuarine conditions drive productivity of plants and animals. So what happens when there's a lack of freshwater inflow? And that raises the salinity and leads to other changes in coastal habitats. And those conditions in turn cause a decline in certain species of plants and animals Things like blue crabs and wolf berries and other foods that whooping cranes love to eat in Texas. You'll find out on the next episode of the Golf Podcast, when whooping cranes go to court. Next time on the Golf Podcast. Uh, we had six lawyers. When we got into the courtroom the first day, I think there were 24 lawyers on the other side. We had stirred up a harness nest.
Thanks for listening to the Golf Podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook, as well as read episode scripts and listen to oral history interviews on our digital archives. Music in this episode came from Lee Rosevere. This is Dr. Jen Brown signing off to grade papers during finals week.